Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Kaufman, and we're about to go beyond the terminus. Why does a tooth need endo? Are you considering endodontically treating a tooth? Or maybe referring a tooth to an endodontist? There are some important questions that you need to answer before you do that. In many cases, the patient may be in discomfort, and there's a lot of pressure on you to do something. And frequently, the pulpite symptoms make for a fairly easy diagnosis. Elevated thermal, percussive, and chewing sensitivity are some of the most obvious signs that are typical of an endodontically involved tooth. But before we commit the patient to treatment, we need to establish why the patient is experiencing this problem. Merely devitalizing a tooth by removing the pulp may relieve the patient's symptoms, but does it really solve what's wrong with the patient? Why did they get this way? In this first example, the second molar has been restored multiple times with a two-surface DO amalgam filling in an attempt to close an open contact without success. The patient constantly complained of food impaction and was unable to maintain adequate hygiene. Poor occlusal relationships and an opposing plunger cusp was present. This second molar is constantly drifting mesially. How will doing endo on the restored tooth fix this problem? So, should we endo treat number 27, the second molar, and restore it with a crown, knowing that we can never close the contact with the existing occlusal relationship? Do we extract the third molar, number 28, to allow hygiene access to the distal crown margin of the tooth that we're about to do endo on and restore. One thing's for sure, restoring the tooth without addressing these issues guarantees recurrence of the problem and carries on the distal aspect. What about the possible frication involvement in that molar that we're about to treat? Will it make a good bridge abutment? All of these questions need to be answered by a comprehensive treatment plan that's established before we initiate the endodontics. In this second example, does the patient have generalized cervical or smooth surface caries that they've been unable to control? Is doing endo on the tooth going to improve their hygiene? In this third example, is the tooth pulpitic because it developed a fracture in one of the marginal ridges? This can happen in a virgin tooth. Mandibular second molars and maxillary premolars are notorious for this. Was the cause an isolated unlucky event with a popcorn kernel? Or do other teeth in the mouth also show facets and evidence of parafunction? bruxism, and potential fracture. Has this patient been breaking cusps and exposing pulps regularly in teeth that really do need crowns? Lastly, does the patient have thermal sensitivity due to abfraction lesions or root exposure due to gingival recession? Is devitalization a real solution to this problem? While it may be initially satisfying to relieve the patient's discomfort and place a restoration, unless we understand why this is occurring, the case has a high chance of failure or recurrence. As an endodontist, I see this all the time. Sometimes the inadequately restored, previously treated case fractures a cusp or a tooth in a way that makes it unrestorable. In other cases, caries under the restoration either renders the endotreated tooth unrestorable or results in contamination of the canal space and eventual endo failure. I would say that 80% of the treated patients that I see did not understand that teeth can become curious after endo treatment, even after they've been restored with crown. We explain and reinforce this concept to the patients before they leave my office in every case. You know, a talented endodontist can perform endodontics on any tooth that can be adequately isolated and that is periodontally sound. The real question becomes, who is in the best position to decide what is in the best interest of the patient? Their dentist, who they may have been seeing for years, or the endodontist who's only seen the patient maybe for a localized consult and knows very little about the patient's motivation, their hygiene, their finances, and their level of cooperation. It's unfair to ask the endodontist to determine restorability and whether this case should be part of the overall treatment plan. These details have to be part of the pre-referral discussion with the dentist prior to the patient being referred to a specialist. We have a responsibility to patients to treat their pain. But we also have a responsibility to find out why this is occurring and to try to take steps to ensure that it doesn't happen again to this tooth or others. Endodontic treatment should be part of a well-thought-out treatment plan, not just putting out a fire in a single tooth and a symptomatic patient. That's why general practitioners and endodontists need to work together to ensure optimal results for the patients that they treat. Remember, when we do the right thing, we both get better, patients and clinicians. Thanks for listening, and join me again when we take another trip beyond the terminus. See you then.